time. Um, so I'm going to talk about mobile app and mobile web performance a little bit. Uh, so how many of you, when you think about walking out on that walkway out on the Alps, you sort of get like uh, that butterflies in your stomach, and you're like, oh god, I don't want to walk out on that. That's just scary, right? Well, these, Ericsson did this study about a year, a year and a half ago, and they put sensors on people's heads to measure their stress response to different experiences. And it turns out that standing in line is like right at this threat stress threshold level. And standing at the edge of a cliff, that butterflies you got in your stomach, is really stressful. But if you have a slow mobile app, that's even worse. <laughs> right? So just think about that. When you build an app or you build a website and it's slow, the feeling that your customers are getting when they interact with your application. And so there's been a whole bunch of studies on what happens when websites and apps are slow. And Google did a study, and this is like ad click data, right? So if you click an ad, if it takes over three seconds to load, over 50% of the people abandon the site and they don't actually go there. Um, another study where they put sensors on people's head and then they slow down the site by half a second, people got frustrated and less engaged. Um, desktop data from like 2001, Walmart and Amazon found that every 100 milliseconds cost them 1% of revenue. And that's just because each page, you know, if you give yourself five minutes to go to Amazon and you only get through seven pages, you have less stuff in your cart by the end of your shop, right? And then the most important stat is 4% of all mobile users admit to throwing their phone when a website is slow. And so when you see <laughs> someone with a cracked screen, it might be because, you know, I've got a cracked screen too, so I'm not one to talk. Um, but I recommend pillows, a bed, something like that. Don't throw it onto the sidewalk. Um, so the problem that we have is that when people are interacting on mobile, they want something that's immersive, immersive, rich, and also fast. And those things don't always balance together. And so that's a really hard thing to do. So how, what can we do to make sure that the things that we're building that people are using on mobile are really cool and fun to do, but also not slow? And so. There are a lot of problems with working on cellular. One thing is that there's a lot of latency as soon as you get onto a cellular network. And that's just inherent of mobile. And so I worked at AT&T for a number of years. And so we have a, at AT&T, we had a free open source tool that measured the network traffic, sort of like a Wireshark. Um, and what, what you see is that if you're on 3G, it can take up to like two seconds, two and a half seconds for a connection just to be established. And all that is is your phone talking to the tower even before you get any TCP IP and packets going. And so you'll see that if you're ever on 3G and you're reading a news article and you click a link and it feels like nothing's happening for about two seconds, that's that, right? So uh, there's the science behind that. Um, and then every round trip takes a long time. So I have, just because that last mile is going over the air to a tower and then from a tower to the back end of a network, that adds a lot of latency. And so what cellular carriers do is once the radio is on, because it takes a long time to turn on the radio, they leave the radio on for a period of time after that last packet is sent. And that's what we're showing down here. So after that last packet is sent, the radio is on for another 10 seconds. And the reason for that is so we avoid this delay at the beginning. And I just touched the, butt, the, the wires. Oh, I won't go that way again. All right. And so. Because the radio is on, that adds to battery drain. So if you have like a website that's sending like a keep alive every 10 or 15 seconds, you may be keeping your customer's cellular radio on. And the problem with keeping the cellular radio on is that you see that little battery icon in the upper right hand corner of your phone go way down really, really fast, right? So there's this balancing act of letting the radio turn off so that we can use our phone till the end of the day without charging, you know, the office, at school, in the car, everywhere we go, right? We've got battery packs in our backpack, all that stuff. Um, and getting stuff to the customer quickly. And so there's this, there's this balancing that we have to look at. And so what I want to talk about today is some tools to help you profile mobile web, mobile apps, um, look at some of the best practices to help speed up the transfer of data to your website or your app. And then I'm going to show you some results and some fixes of companies that we've worked with to actually help people make their apps run better. And so two tools. One of them is a tool that I worked on when I was at AT&T, and it's called Video Optimizer. 
And I don't really like the name. It used to be called the Application Resource Optimizer because it was for all apps. But then marketing thought that people really cared about video more and they changed the name. Um, and then the other tool is called Web Page Test. It's another free and open source tool. And it can be used to um, profile a web page. And you can do it on a mobile phone. You can do it on a desktop. You can do just about anything you want. And then I'm going to talk a little about a website speed test, which focuses on images specifically. Has anybody used a tool like web page test before? No, OK, cool. Oh, all right, awesome. Um, so I'm going to start with Video Optimizer, which is testing native apps, iOS, Android. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on Android here because it's a GDG group. But if you do iOS development, we can do exactly the same things that you wanted that we're talking about here. Um, but the way it works is you want to, we're taking a network trace of all the packets coming in and out of the phone. And in this case, I did it on an Android running 7.0. And so you pick your device, you pick your collector type. We can set the network conditions. Now, why do you care about the network conditions? Well, here, we're in a city, we're getting 4G, everything is fast and lovely. But if you go out 20 kilometers out into the country, you may be on 3G or edge. And your app is going to be very, very different than it is here. And you want to make sure that your app looks good and behaves well on slower network conditions. At Facebook, they have 2G Tuesdays, where they throttle the Wi-Fi down to a really, really slow speed so they, all the engineers can see what the app is looking like and how it behaves on a really, really slow network. The other thing that we can do with this is we can set a profile so that you can make it slow and then fast and then slow and then fast. And so you can see what happens when the network changes are fluctuating as if you're on a train going you know, into the city and then out of the city. You know, so you can see how video is streaming when network conditions are changing. We can, do, we can do some man in the middle secure collection. We also record the video on the screen. So you can see what's happening on the screen at the same time all this network traffic is going on. You name your trace and then you go. And so when you use a tool like Wireshark that's collecting data packets, you get this table of you know, all sorts of stuff. And it's really, really complicated. Um, what we try to do is when it's running, you see what's on the screen. And this is Zillow, which is an app in America. And I like to look at really expensive houses because it's fun, right? Um, and so what we can see what's going on on the screen here. This is what's showing up on my computer. And you can see it's opening up a VPN on the phone. And the VPN starts and stops on the phone, but it lets us grab all the packets. That's sort of our interface for grabbing all the packets. Um, so the traffic still goes out over the regular cellular connection. There's no VPN to some strange endpoint anywhere. So you test your app. And then when you're done, there's a red stop button. Pretty straightforward stuff. We want to make this really, really easy to use. And then you know, I was saying Wireshark gives you a really, really complicated interface. And you can read all the docs. And maybe you'll figure out how it works. But we like to take it down to 40 best practices, green check marks, and red Xs. Right? And if you have a red X, then ah, that's some place I need to look at to see if I can fix it. And we try to, I've sort of grouped these best practices into like how you treat files and images, how you treat connections, HTML, security, video, and then we, the last one is GPS. Um, and so we kind of, I'm not going to go into detail on all of those because I don't, don't have enough time to do all of that, but I'm going to talk about a few of those in ways you can optimize that content. Web page test is almost the same thing, but it's for web pages. And you just go to webpagetest.org. Or you can set up your own private instance, because it is open source. You can just set up on your computer. And you can test on any browser. And so the guy who runs this is Patrick Meenan. He works for Google. And he has literally in his basement next to the Christmas decorations like 600 phones, just racks and racks of phones in his basement. Um, and so like this Moto G4 that I'm testing on is literally in Dulles, Virginia, in Pat's basement. And you can throttle the connection. You can see there's like six tabs of different things you can do to modify your testing. So you can do all sorts of things. Um, SPOF is single point of failure. So you can like black hole all content. Um, this is useful for things like Twitter, where if you want to see what the page looks like in China, where all Twitter.com is blocked, you can actually see what happens to your web page. Does it still load? There were a few news organizations that didn't load in China because there was a blocking script from Twitter. And because that Twitter script couldn't run, the web page didn't work at all. Right? So you can test those sorts of things with a tool like Web Page Test. All right. And when you get the results, you get some grades up in the top. 
you start to see things like how long it took the page to load. Like this page took 19.6 seconds to load. That's really long and really bad. Um, and this is actually, when we do the workshop later, this is the web page that I built that isn't optimized. You'll see it's 11.2 megabytes down over there at the other side, right? These are images that aren't optimized. So if we make the images smaller, we'll see that the page loads faster. You know, sort of basic stuff here. And so let's talk about some ways we can do this. One is delivery speed. Okay, and so this is, this is my analogy. And when, I, when, when I'm back in the States, I live outside of Seattle right here. And one day I ordered a package from a company in Vancouver, British Columbia, which is right here. I was like, that's awesome. I'm gonna get this package really, really fast. Except for FedEx on all international deliveries to America, they go to Memphis, Tennessee first, <laughs> right? So my package flew to Memphis, Tennessee, and then flew back to Seattle, and then I got the package. Unfortunately, a lot of network traffic does exactly the same thing. There was a Facebook incident where their mobile app was really, really slow a few years ago in Indonesia. And some of that's because Indonesia is a, you know, it's an island country. There's a lot of 2G. It's, you know, it's very hard terrain to get good cellular coverage. Um, but then they also discovered that they were routing all Indonesian traffic through a CDN in South America, which is halfway around the world. Right, so that's not good. Um, so here's another example. Do you guys know about crypto jacking? Have you heard about crypto jacking? All right, so CoinHive is one of those crypto jacking scripts that's out there. And so what crypto jacking is, is people insert this JavaScript onto a web page and it's up to 100% and is mining cryptocurrency in the background on your computer. Um, and there was a big attack, I don't know, about three or four weeks ago, and it hit, it was installed and it, it got, stuck into a chat bot that's on a thousands and thousands of websites and it was impacted for like 36 hours and there was an article and they're like, we believe that the attackers made about $3, <laughs> right? Which is, you know, what is that, like two pounds? Two pounds? Right. All right, anyway, so it's not, it's not a very lucrative hack, right? <laughs> but they have, this company has one server in Germany and so if you ping that server, right, in Munich, it's really, really fast because that's in Germany, but you get to San Jose, it takes a lot longer, and Singapore obviously takes longer because the speed of light is really, really fast, but when it's in cables and has to go under one ocean or two oceans or across all of Asia, it adds a lot of latency. And so that's my fancy PowerPoint drawing of packets going from California <laughs> to Germany. Um, and so one thing that you can do if you want to make sure your content gets delivered to customers faster is you can use a content delivery network. And what that means is your first connection will go all the way back to Germany, but then it's going to be served at the end of the edge of the internet. And so like you can see they're all, this is one CDN map that I just pulled off the internet. And you can see that, you know, if now the next time the content is requested from Glasgow is going to come from London, which is pretty darn close instead of Germany, right? The, the file is gonna get delivered a lot faster. So your content is cached on the edge of the network so it doesn't have to travel as far geographically across the world to get to you. Another thing that we see that affects delivery speed a lot are redirects. And maybe you've heard of Google. And when you load Google for the first time, this is web page test. And so what web page test does is it builds a waterfall and it shows what hap each file being downloaded and you want to see a nice steep waterfall and the first time you go to Google on your brand new computer, right, because the second and third time it's cached, but the first time you go to Google, you just type in google.com, it redirects you with a 301 to www.google.com and then does a second redirect to the HTTPS version of that same site. And unfortunately what that means is that web page test gives Google an F for first time, time to first byte because the first byte actually comes in at three seconds on that first load. This isn't just Google, this is like half of the internet does this. Everybody redirects to that HTTPS. But what I'm trying to show is everybody does this, everybody has this issue, so it's something that you can look at and, and see what's going on. The other cool thing about web page test is you can record a video of what's going on, and you'll see here that Google isn't actually all that slow to load because once that first byte arrives, it's really fast to load the page, right? It only takes like, 200 milliseconds, once that byte arrives, the page loads really, really quickly. And I believe I did this on mobile, so there's all sorts of other things that were happening here to make it run slower. That is mobile, you can see that's the mobile screen. Um, and then, 
from a mobile app perspective, I was testing a music app, and every single time it was downloading album art, it did a redirect. So it said, hey, I want that album art. It redirected and asked for the album art. So in this one test, in like 10 minutes, it did 240 redirects. And this app was getting a lot of publicity in the States, and people were like, have you noticed that it feels like the images are really slow? And I'm like, I know why, because it's doing this. Um, that same app, 33 of those redirects didn't work because it gave a 404 error. Like, it, was, it, it went to a place, then redirected to another place, and it wasn't there. And so 404 errors are obviously bad because people want the content, and you're not delivering it to people. So you want to avoid errors like that. And then trivia question. Does anyone know? This is from Video Optimizer. Here is a response 418. Does anyone know what a 418 response code is? It goes back to the beginning of the internet. At the beginning of the internet at research organization, research universities around the country, people were plugging in cameras pointing at the coffee maker. The idea being is you could load the web page, and if there was coffee in the pot, you could go get coffee. But if there was no coffee, maybe you'd hang out, and hopefully somebody else would make the coffee for you. And as an April Fool's joke, 418 is the response, I am a teapot. But what's really cool about that is somebody at PBS, which is uh, public broadcasting in America, decided to be really cool to make every single image respond with, I am a teapot, which is like the ultimate in geek humor, because the only person who sees that is somebody who's looking at response headers like me. Um, but I think it's funny. Um, so the other thing that we can do and, and is make the content delivery more efficient. And so this is an Amazon box. I'm sure you've all experienced this with Amazon, right? Where you order like, you know, like a hair clip and it comes in a box like this big and it's all bubble wrap in this tiny little thing in the corner. Um, a lot of the content that's delivered over the internet is very similar to that Amazon box that you got off your front porch last week. So what kind of content is delivered across the internet? This is from the HTTP archive. So web page tests, they, do, they crawl the top million sites and see what builds the web pages that are out there. And basically what we have is about 25% text, 50% images, and 25% video. So what can we do to optimize text, images, and video? Well, let's see what we can do. This is a mobile app. And it's a video streaming app. And so you, you sign in, and it starts loading up information about all of the shows that you can watch. And it puts up you know, movie posters or whatever about each episode of, of what you want to watch. And that is populated by a 130 kilobyte JSON file. Right? It has all the information, stuff like America's Got Talent, the image URL to load that image. Now, the problem is that. 131, 130 kilobyte image isn't compressed. So it takes a longer to download than if it was actually compressed. Right? If you compress it with gzip, it's 16 kilobytes. If you use Brotly, which is newer, um, a newer algorithm for compression from Google, um, and they're all named after uh, Swiss pastries. It's a bunch of researchers in, 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 in Switzerland. And so, um, it actually is, you get a, it squeezes just a little bit more compression out of it, and it decompresses at the same speed as gzip. There's some controversy over whether it compresses as fast. Some people think it's a little bit slower, so they recommend not using it for dynamic content, but only for content that's static. Um, but if you download this file and it's 16 kilobytes, obviously it's going to download way faster than 131 kilobytes. So the request for all those images can start faster, and that screen will load faster. Right? You're not saving, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, you're not saving that much data. It's 100 kilobytes, 110 kilobytes. But you're getting that screen to populate faster, which lets people get to the stuff they want to use your app for, which is watching movies. Um, and so we see a lot of this. We see a lot of applications that just their text files will download really fast. I'm not worried about it. But if you can squeeze out 90% you know, more efficiency to it, it, it's probably worthwhile to do that. Um, another Images obviously being half of the web in terms of size. Also, mobile apps use a lot of them. Um, is a ripe place for optimization. So this is another app I was looking at. And, it's, and when I was looking at this, there's a bunch of movie posters, right? I was reading about Frank Sinatra. And um, 
what we can see is you see the image right here is this one down here. But when I downloaded the image, it was twice as big as it had to, over twice as wide as it had to be. Like this is the width of my screen is 1440 and it was downloaded at 1555 wide, which is a lot larger. And the problem with that is it's 1.5 megabytes. Now you can see here I was on Wi-Fi, so it downloaded really fast, but what if I was out in the country on 3G? This page would have taken forever to load and it would have been very frustrating. So what can we do to optimize that image? Well, the first thing we can do is, hey, this screen is 1440 wide, let's make this 720 wide, right? Simple math, 50% of the screen looks like that, and it's 76% smaller, right? Pretty straightforward stuff. Um, what else can we do? JPEG is a um, lossy format, so you can save it as a lower quality, you lose pixels. So you start to get jaggy sort of things in the image. Google recommends that anything you save for the web, you save at 85% quality because you save some data and nobody really notices the difference. In general, you're fine. Like if you're doing, if you're building a web page for someone who's doing like sports photography or something like that, maybe you don't want to do that, right? Because people are expecting really high quality images. But for most things, you can get away with 85% quality. That's what it looks like. Now, can we see the pixel loss? Sure, if we zoom in like that and it looks like that, right? But in the context of this screen right here, you're fine, right? What, what's happening here is it's downloading this giant thing with millions and millions of pixels and then throwing away most of the pixels because it can't display it on the screen. So that's gonna, that image gets us down to 553K, so it's 65% savings. But what we can do now is we can do both. What if we do 85% quality and change the number of pixels we're now down to under 200 kilobytes, right? Huge savings. Um, now, this is more complicated because this is one phone, right? And there are a lot of phones out there. Um, and, and it's very complicated. I did all of this manually. And if you're building a website and you've got 10,000 images or something like that, you don't want to do this manually. Um, but there are tools out there. And so one tool is a tool like Cloudinary. It's a web-based or it's a cloud-based system. You upload your images. And then you just play around with the URLs. So there you can see I set the quality to 85 and the width to 720, and I got that same image, right? It just delivers it. They've got a CDN, so it takes care of all the delivery stuff that we were talking about earlier. Um, but you can go even better. They've got a tool called QAuto, and what that does is they do, there's a, a structural similarity, and they, there's an algorithm that says, Will a human eye see the difference between these two images? And once it gets to a certain threshold, they're like, this is the lowest quality you can do that no one will see the difference. And we've, we're even better, we're at like 128 kilobytes. And then the last thing I did, I was testing this on Chrome. Chrome lets you do WebP. And WebP, JPEG came out in the 90s, right? So it's algorithms from the 90s for compression. WebP is from Google. It's much more recent. It's for like two or three years old now. And now we're down to 84 kilobytes. So for your Chrome users or for your Android users, because obviously WebP is supported in Android, now we've made this image 95% smaller than it was at the beginning. So it's going to be delivered really fast to almost any speed network. Um, but this sort of delivery is really, really hard. So I went through all of this data from the HTTP archive. And you may have heard of Twitter, right? And they deliver probably billions and billions of profile pictures, right? Every day on their web, on, the, on their apps, and all things like that. And so I did a study, a random study of 1,000 Twitter images, and 67% had room for optimization. I just put them up through the cloud and everything to look for QAuto and FAuto to see if I could see a difference. And two thirds of them weren't optimized. They could be smaller, and actually of one in 1,000 of the Twitter images were over 50 kilobytes. Some of them were like 550 kilobytes. That's how I learned that you can make animated images, your profile picture in Twitter. There are people out there with these crazy, and some of them are, um, I'll talk about this in a little bit, but they have metadata that's bloating, this, that, like they modified it in Photoshop and Photoshop threw all this metadata in it and it has like 250 kilobytes of metadata that's being downloaded that no one as a user of Twitter ever sees, but it's just bloating the page. 
And um, you know, as I was mentioning, it's really hard to optimize the size of your images for an individual screen because there are a lot of different size screens. This is different Android screens seen at Akamai in one or two days in December, right? There's 6,200 screens here. The size of the box is how many devices of that type hit it. The color is how fast it loaded. So these are all like Samsung S7s and 8s, and then it goes down, and red is slow and green is fast. So how can you optimize images to the devices? And so like in, on the web, there's a thing called responsive images. And so what I've done here is if the screen is under 800, 480 pixels, show this image. If it's between 480 and 768, show that image, right? And it's, I'm just using Cloudinary to resize them because I was lazy and I didn't want to create all those images for myself. And it was free, so I did it. And then finally, if it doesn't fit any of these, just show the original image. And so what does that look like? And the other trick I'm going to show you here, um, there are all sorts of other things you can do with this tool, but every other one of these I made it sepia so that you can see as I change the size of the screen and a different image loads, you'll be able to see a difference. And so if I come out of display here, and I go to the website. All right, so here's a picture of a church, right? Big screen, and as I reduce the size of the image, it's eventually, right? So I hit one of those breakpoints, and it downloaded a different image. So if I were looking at this on a tablet, this is the image it would be downloaded. It would be a smaller image, wouldn't use as many kilobytes. It would download faster, and then I go smaller, get another image, and then there's one smaller sepia, right? So you can set up all these, these different breakpoints so that you get a different image, so that smaller devices get a smaller image. You can also do things for retina devices. It gets a 2x image, so you don't have to serve retina images to people. I guess it's now hip in cer certain places in America to have the Moto Razor and walk around with the Razor. And um, I don't know if you guys even know the Moto Razor. Do you guys know the Moto Razor? Super thin flip phone. It was super cool like 13 years ago. <laughs> um, had a really crummy browser in it. Um, but with things like responsive images, you can deliver the right content to those really low-powered browsers and still give really awesome experiences to the person with like the 25-inch monitor in, in, you know, at their desk. Um, another really cool thing you can do, so this is image search at Google, right? And so you're searching for cats in costume because why wouldn't you? And the first thing that loads is you get these like colorful boxes, and then you get pictures of cats and costumes, because cats and costumes. And what you can see is like this, this cat is wearing a green costume, so this one is green, and that's pink, so this one was pink, and this is a darker brown, right? So the colors of these background, these, these you know, preload, preview images sort of match what's going to pop in eventually. So you, the user gets an idea of what's going to show up, an idea of how the screen is going to be laid out right away, even though it doesn't really tell you anything about the image. But it kind of gives them like, oh, there's going to be a picture here. So I can scroll down and read the article and then come back up. Um, there's a tool called Squip that makes a vector image. So this image right here. And so why do you do this? Well, this image right here, full size is like 1.6 megabytes. You might, even if it's 150, this image right here is 700 bytes. So you load this in the background. 700 bytes, that's less than one round trip, right? And so this is here, people know the image is coming, and then pop, the pretty image comes in afterwards. Okay, and then so the last speakers talked about the greatest of all time, but I'm gonna talk about goats. <laughs> and so this is a picture of my goat back in Seattle. This is Nora, and I'm gonna hit the video, and she's eating a cedar leaf, right? It's really cute, right? But I want to make this an animated GIF so it loops, and I can put it on my web page so people can see this goat. And so this is the video I took with my phone, 1.4 megabytes. Use FFmpeg, make it an animated GIF, right? Looping, awesome. It's 256 colors, just like we want it to be, because that's what GIFs give you. But it's 3.8 megabytes. It just got 270% bigger. Now, why did that happen? Well, the reason is animated GIFs is like a flipbook of images. 
that was actually 33 GIFs that play it. I don't know what I don't know what the frames per second are, but it's playing it like a movie and looping, right? So you can see you can pull out all the images from it and see them individually. So what if I just took that movie and made it 256 colors, right? Now the movie's 256 colors, right? And you can use a video tag. And so you set video to autoplay, you set it to muted and to loop, and then you say, look at the goats, and it should play. And so the reason I have it set to muted, even though it uh, doesn't have any audio, is that Chrome and Safari on mobile will not autoplay a video unless it's muted. And that's because when you're in class and you're surfing the web and a video starts playing, it's really embarrassing. So they're fixing that for you, and it will only autoplay if it's muted. I think Safari um, does that now in the, the latest version of Safari, too. Um, so the problem with that is when you load video tags on the web, the video files are some of the last things that are loaded because Chrome and Safari know that video files are really, really big. So let's get all the JavaScript, the CSS, the HTML, the images, and everything first. But coming soon, and this is now in preview versions of Safari, and I think it's coming to others, is you can put images into the picture tag. And in the picture tag, images are loaded faster. And so in this case, this is a file that says, if, if you can load the MP4, load that and loop it. If you can't load the WebP, animated WebP, because that's going to be smaller. And then if you can't do anything, load up the, the, the GIF, the GIF, you, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> OK. Last thing we're going to talk about, we sort of segued into it. We're going to talk about video, because video is a huge part now of mobile apps and mobile um, <clears throat> mobile uh, web, web pages. And much as web pages and things, people get and video stalls or it takes a long time to start up. And so this company that professes to make your video really fast invented their marketing term of buffer rage. And then I put this cool picture because we all know that when people are mad, they throw their phone. Um, so what they basically said, found that after two seconds, up to two seconds, nobody cares. But after two seconds, you lose about 6% of your users every single second as time goes on. And this isn't true for all videos. There's different types of videos. There are the videos of a cat dressed like a shark on a Roomba chasing a duck, right? <laughs> and if it's a short video like that, people abandon it a lot faster because after two seconds, you start questioning your life choices, <laughs> right? Why did I click a link for a cat wearing a shark costume on a Roomba chasing a duck? Whereas if it's a movie, you're like, I'm about to spend two hours watching a movie anyway. I'll wait another 10 seconds for the movie to start. So what leads to a startup delay on a, on a, on a video? And so what happens, this is HLS video, but the first thing that happens is a text file is downloaded with a list of the available streams and it gives you different bandwidths that are available. The player picks one of the streams. The stream lists all the segments, and then it starts downloading the segments, and hopefully the video starts playing. That's what we want to have happen. But here's an example of that first manifest file. And so you can see it's like, here are, I think there are eight. I keep forgetting to count before I get in front of an audience, and then it's embarrassing to count it. Um, but the first manifest file, is 8.5 megabits per second. Now, a video running 8.5 megabits per second is going to be really hard to get running really well on a cellular connection. And so what do we find out? What happens when it does that? The player selects at 8.5. And so in streaming, the player has to pick a video stream to start, and so it just picks the first one. Got to do something right. So it picks that 8.5 megabit stream. It tries to start downloading it. It takes a long time to fill, and the video doesn't play. That's what happens. So then the player says, I'm going to go change to a different stream that's a lot smaller so that I can start playing this video, a lower quality video stream. And we can see that happen. This is actually what's happening. This is that high quality stream. It requests it. It starts downloading it. It's like, that's not downloading fast enough. Give me this lower quality stream. And then it starts downloading segment 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so what's leading to that startup delay is that this first bandwidth is too high quality. And what we generally see is the streams are out of order. 
and like one of the middle of the road ones is put up at the top. So why do you put one of the middle of the road ones up at the top? You're sort of balancing quality versus startup time. And you may notice this. When you're watching a video, the quality kind of stinks for like the first five or 10 seconds, and then it snaps up to really good. It's because the player is picking one of these middle of the road ones, and if you've got a really good network connection, it pops down to one of the really high quality ones. So that's why you're seeing that in real life. Um, 8.5 megabits is way too high for initial streaming, so pick one of the middle ones. And we see a lot of top, top websites and, and apps doing that. So what leads to stalls? So as long as this is what's in the buffer, this is the, the icon for what's in the buffer. You'll see it on YouTube and things like that. As long as that bar is ahead of the dot, the video is going to play. And that's what we want to have happen. But what leads to stalls? This is one where I had a stall. And so the dot caught up to the bar, right? And so it stops playing. But then what happens, and, and I do this. I don't know if you guys do this. But you start seeing more video come, but it hasn't started playing. And the player hasn't started playing it because it knows as soon as it starts playing, it's just going to stall again in like half a second. But if you hit pause, play, pause, play, it starts playing a little bit, <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about, right? Um, so the player is constantly bouncing, like, how good is the network versus how good is the playback? And you know that when you hit the pause, play, pause, play, it's just going to stall again in like half a second or two. Maybe, maybe you'll get a second or two. Um, so the, the player is trying to balance all of these things so that it plays really, really well. And so there are Cloudinary and other tools will automatically build all of these for you. So you can upload a video. It builds all the streams for you. And it's figured out what the right bandwidths are for all of that. So that's a cool thing to do. So let's look at those streams from this list again. Um, so this is the bandwidth for those different streams. And what you can see here is at low bandwidth, we've got this nice growth pattern. And then at high is we've got a different slope. But there's like this gap in the middle right here. And that's a problem, actually. Because large jumps in throughput can lead to streaming issues. And let's show you what happens. This is another stream where we start at 1080, 8.5 megabits per second. It drops to 600 because it can't keep up. But then you know the network's actually better than 600, so the phone's like, well, let's go up to 3.5. But it can't quite do 3.5, so it drops it back down to 1.2. But then it jumps back up to 3.5, and then back and forth a bunch of times, right? And so as a customer, you see the quality go from good to not so good to good to not, about like every three or four seconds, which is a really aggravating as a user. And so you know, when the visual quality of um, the video is changing constantly, that's distracting to the actual video that you're trying to watch. The other thing to look at is look at segment four. We downloaded it 3.5 megabits per second. But then we changed quality so much, we downloaded it again at 1.2 megabits per second. Which one's going to show up? We probably want to see the 3.5, right? And then if you look at 5 and 6, we downloaded it at 1.2 megabits per second twice. right? So the problem is the player is getting confused because it keeps changing the, the throughput so often that it's downloading content multiple times, which is actually might lead to a stall because it's downloading stuff that if maybe, what if it could download 7, 8, and 9 instead of 5 and 6, right? The buffer would get fuller faster. And so this changing the bit rate back and forth actually can lead to stalls as well. Um, so in summary, um, we talked a little about CDNs and redirects to de deliver content faster, and talked a lot about how we can make the files smaller by compressing text files, by reducing the size, quality, and format, changing the format of the image. And then playing around with the video bit rate. Because if we can lower the, find that sweet spot between bit rate and quality so that it streams well but still looks nice, um, it's a, it makes for a good experience that doesn't stall and it, and it starts up fast for the end user. And so the tools I talked about today are web page test, website speed test for testing on the web, if you want to do that. Um, video optimizer is the tool that I worked on for many years at AT&T for testing iOS and Android apps. Um, I wrote a book for O'Reilly called High Performance Android Apps, and that's the PDF if you want to take a look at it. And then I talked a little bit about Cloudinary. And so in the workshop in a little bit, what we're going to do is I built a web page that's super inefficient. And we're going to use some really easy image uh, optimization tools 
to make that page way, way smaller so that it loads up faster. And so it'll be a, a cool little exercise to play around with that. And so if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take any questions at this point. Yeah. A quick plug on a couple of other resources yeah. uh, on this. So on Think with Google, it's a, a web page we've just recently released. Um, it allows you to do a revenue calculator of what the impact of speed is. So mm -hmm. we're looking at speed as a bit of an afterthought, it's a nice thing to do. Um, that's one way of approaching it, where you can actually sort of look at the dollar numbers that are associated with it. And you can also, on that same site, do a comparison with other websites to see where you stack against your competitors. So again, when you're looking at, oh right, okay, that site is loading that much faster, you can actually see the dollar amount and the, <laughs> the impact that that can make, uh, which is kind of important. The second sort of plug on that is we've got something called uh, mobile site certification. It's like a four hour course, um, it's self paced, um, and actually we could run it here as a study jam within uh, the GDG if you, if you want to. Um, but out of that, you can get a very good high level overview of some of the best practice uh, around speed and, and other areas. Uh, and it's, it's well worth doing. At the end of it, you get a certificate, which is kind of handy anyway, uh, but uh, we can do things like that. And uh, Google also has, is it, I always mess up if it's page speed insights or speed page. <coughs> it's one or the other. I've, I Google it wrong the first time, and so I've, I've, I'm always wrong the first time I Google it. But it, it also gives you a grade for both. It gives you a mobile score and a, um, and a desktop score. And what's important about that is one of the things for your, your search engine optimization is how fast it loads on mobile. So if it's slow on mobile, you actually get, you don't get as high in the, the and we're trying to bring web page tests, page speed insights, and uh, within the Chrome browser, the tooling that you can see uh, on speed all converting together. So yeah. hopefully that should be clear again. There are other things out there. Uh, anyway, they're all saying the same thing. Speed. <laughs> 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 So this will obviously work quite well if your site is really resource intensive, so mm -hmm. you've got a lot of images and videos, that sort of thing. What can you do to optimize your site other than you know, read rights and CDNs and if you're more kind of text based? Well, the, the text optimizations are there too. And so you know, the other things you can look at is um, like the Chrome Dev Tools will t show you a lot about how your JavaScript is loading and how intensive the JavaScript is or if you have um, scripts that are blocking if you have scripts loading before the CSS, the CSS can't render, right? So there's things you can do to make sure that your scripts aren't blocking downloads of other things. Um, and a lot of the tools that, that we mentioned in web page test will, will find those things for you. Um, other things you can look for, there's tools out there that will look at um, how much of your CSS you're actually using on the page. And so a lot of sites have this giant CSS document, but only use 15% on that page. So if you can untangle that, sometimes that's not a trivial thing to do. Um, similar with um, if you're using some really large JavaScript libraries, you might be able to pull out some of the dependencies from that as well. So that you're just downloading, again, fewer objects or smaller objects so that they're faster. There are also options for using accelerated mobile pages or AMP and progressive web apps. Okay, there's tools for submission. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, do you have any suggestion about the case where you could have, for example, sockets in a mobile uh, user which have a lot of uh, messages going through? So, this is a lot of videos. Uh, are there any practices in this? So, I mean, to some degree, if it's a chat app, if it's a chatty app, like, there's nothing you can really do to stop that. You know, the radio is going to be on, and that's just sort of how it works. So, if your web socket is open and no communication is going down, that connection will still be open, but the radio will still turn off. So, if it's the connection is still between your server and the tower is still open, and the tower knows how to connect to the phone still. And so the connection is actually, the web socket connection is still open, but the radio can turn off after that 10 or 15. Every network has a different timer. And 
different networks have different timers in different regions too, just to make it you know more complicated. So that that it still will happen. But if it is very chatty, you know, if your application is very chatty, it will still drain the battery as fast as if you were streaming a movie. Essentially, um, there's a story of T-Mobile in America getting a voicemail app kicked off of the Android store early, early on. This is like Android 2 or something like that. Because what this voicemail app did, this was before push notifications. So it wanted to check to see if there's a new voicemail. So every second, this app said, hey, is there a new voicemail? It's like the kids in the back seat. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Right? Just pinging constantly. Con the radio never turned off. People were complaining about battery life. People were returning phones to the store. Right, the battery, and and you know, going back to my time at AT and T, um, the largest reason phones are returned to stores is because of battery life, and so what happens, at least at AT and T, is they wipe the phone and then they test the hardware because they can sell it as a refurbished phone. Ninety six percent of them have no hardware issues, which implies that there was a software issue on the device, which means that there was probably an app or many apps that were just so chatty or doing something that were just killing the battery on the device. So it's, it's something that if you as a developer can fix in your application, it will make things run better. We, we, our tool, Application Resource Optimizer, helped Facebook do that about six years ago. That, that Android app in the background was turning on the radio 14 times an hour and only actually making six requests, but the radio was turning on. The, the requests weren't synchronized. And so we had them synchronize all the requests. It was only turning on four times an hour. You know, that's 60% battery savings in the background. So when you're not using the app, you know, so people's battery, their, their battery lasted a lot longer. And there are a lot of really cool things now in Android, like the job scheduler and the doze mechanisms that help turn all of that off now. But um, so you should use those to help, you know, um, the job scheduler, what that does is it sort of takes all of the connections that all the apps want to do and synchronizes them together rather than having your app ping and your app ping, right? And they're all just turning on the radio whenever the heck they want to. Awesome. Well, I think there's like dessert and stuff, so I don't want to keep you from, okay. from food. It's either, you know, either if you're speaking before there's food, people are anxious, but if it's after food, everybody's sleepy. So I don't know. This is probably the better place to be. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.